1946, after the Second World War, Winston Churchill gave a speech in Zurich proclaiming that Europe should rebuild as the United States of Europe. While initial proponents of European integration saw it merely as a war preventative measure, due to the rise of technological advancements and the phenomenon we know today as globalization, Europe has since seen its integration produce an overabundance of economic prosperity. And unfortunately, it's already under threat. Skeptics of European integration are already on the rise throughout European politics. In fact, Euroscepticism became a reality in 2016 when the United Kingdom voted in a referendum to leave the European Union. This decision is called Brexit, and it has disastrous consequences for the UK's economy. And in fact, these effects of Brexit are so severe that ultimately Brexit should be reversed in order for the UK to maintain its economic prosperity. Now, when talking about Brexit, it's probably a good idea to understand what is the European Union. Well, the EU is not a military alliance like NATO. It's not a free trade association like NAFTA. The easiest way to think about the EU is that it is a single economy. And while it's made up of a bunch of countries that each have their own economies, it's all these economies coming together to form one singular transnational economy. And in order to govern this single transnational economy, the EU forms a level of politics which transcends the nation state. So, a transnational politics in order to govern the transnational economy. Now, at the economic level, the EU has been able to create its integration through what's called the European Single Market. And the UK's growth in its economy has been heavily reliant on this creation. The single market does three key things. First, it eliminates tariffs on all trade between EU countries. Second, it creates a customs union, and the customs union allows goods to move freely throughout the union because it creates a common regulation framework, so countries don't have to worry about their products that are coming in and out of their borders freely being of different standards. And it also sets common external tariffs on all countries outside of the union, so no one country has more advantageous tariff rates than another. Finally, being a part of the EU's market, the EU negotiates all free trade agreements for all of the countries. So while countries don't have the right to negotiate these agreements themselves, in return, <coughs> these countries receive very competitive free trade agreements. Because when you combine all the economies of the European Union into one economy, it forms the second largest economy in the world. And this highly incentivizes external countries to reach an agreement. And they're willing to make major concessions to have access to such a large market which is home to over half a billion people. Now, there are three alternatives for Britain after it leaves the European Union. It has voted to leave the European Union, but it hasn't yet decided what type of relationship it wants to form with the EU. The first alternative is what's called the Norwegian model. And this is retaining most of its single market membership through membership of what's called the European Economic Area. The second is the Canadian model, which is negotiating its own free trade agreement with the European Union. And most economists point to Canada because Canada is a very recently signed agreement. It's of a similar sized economy to the UK's. And it's the most extensive and comprehensive agreement that the EU has been willing to sign to date. Finally, economists point to the World Trade Organization model. And economists don't call this the American model, but I think since we're all good Americans and we're in the US, it's probably worth mentioning that this is how we trade with the European Union today. So we're going to proceed by looking at the economic effects of Brexit in each of these three scenarios. But in order to do that, we first need to determine what criteria constitutes a healthy economy. And there are three, cri three key criteria which I've determined constitute a healthy economy in today's society. Really, since regulated capitalism is the only economic system that is in practice today, while politically we have different structures, economically it's the only structure we have remaining today with the fall of the Soviet Union, we need to measure how well is our regulated capitalism working. And second, because if we're trying to be ethical but we're in a globalized society, we need to make sure that this wealth we are creating does not come at the expense of other countries as well. We want our economies to be dependent on foreign success and not come at a cost of foreign success. And finally, we want all the wealth that is being created to benefit everybody. We want everybody's wages to be going up. We don't want this to only be benefiting the elite, the very rich, while everybody else 
is still becoming poorer and poorer. So there are three criteria which measure this. And, quite, and, these, and these are the three criteria. First, there is gross domestic product, which is GDP. This measures how much wealth a, a nation is creating. Second, there is foreign direct investment. And this measures how much of that wealth is dependent on foreign investment. And finally, average wages measures how much of the wealth is going to everybody. And it's a good indicator to, to let us know whether the wealth that's being created is helping everybody out in the country or just the few and the elite and the rich. So we're going to proceed by looking at these three economic measurements and comparing them to the, th to the three models that Britain could choose after it leaves the European Union. And before we look at the numbers, because in order to understand the numbers, you really have to understand the details that each of these models occur. So starting off with the Norwegian model, the Norwegian model is at a disadvantage to EU membership in two key areas. First, Norway's outside of the customs union, and this scares the EU because the EU can't guarantee that Norwegian laws are up to the same standards as EU laws. So in order to make sure that the standards are the same, the EU requires Norwegian businesses to document the origin of their products, and that they're either made in the European Union or that they meet over 500 EU product-specific rules. Now for Norway, this isn't a very big deal because a lot of their economy is based off of agriculture and fishing. It's pretty easy to say, I caught this fish off the coast of Norway, I grew this wheat in Norway, but when you're in the UK and you have a very large manufacturing sector, think about a car and the thousands of parts that are in a car, and that these parts come from all over the world based off of our global supply chain system. This becomes a major burden for UK businesses to document where all these products came from, all the parts in the car, and uh, that they meet EU standards. That's a very burdensome and expensive task. The second area where Norway's at a disadvantage is Norway is out, does not get to take advantage of the free trade agreements that the EU has negotiated. And while it does have the right to create its own free trade agreements, which could be more tailored to their economy, they don't have, as, since they're a smaller economy outside of the European Union, they have less negotiating power to make other countries be willing to give them more concessions. So economists generally agree that although the UK could leave and do the Norwegian model, that it won't be able to replicate any type of free trade agreement it currently enjoys as an EU member. Now the Canadian model has the same disadvantages as the Norwegian model. Uh, there are some benefits when it comes to having to, uh, when it does not have to follow as many rules and is not subjected to as many rights. But economically, it's the same disadvantages, but there's even more, because it's dis more disintegrated from the European Union. Mainly, this comprises of the lack of access to the service sector and the economy. Now, in developed countries, services is the majority of our economy. And if you don't know what a service is, it's really when business is done, but there's not really some type of product that's being traded. Really, the, I think the best example is airfare. You're not buying an airplane seat, you're not buying an airplane. Really, you're paying someone for a service to take you from point A to B, but you don't actually receive a product in return. And while this comprises for most developed economies around 60 to 70 percent of their economy, it's actually noticeably higher for the UK. So there's more at stake if they don't have access to the service sector. Because over 80 percent of the UK's economy consists of services. And the biggest one which that the UK will be disadvantaged at is the lack of access to the financial services sector. This is very important, especially for the City of London, which is a financial capital in the world. As an EU member, British financial firms have access to what is called passporting. And what passporting allows British businesses to do is they can set up firms and have access to the whole European market from just having a firm somewhere in the European Union. This incentivizes external businesses to create firms and go through the authorization process in the, European Union, in the UK, specifically in London, because they have access then to the whole EU market. Whenever Britain leaves, the European Union. Businesses from outside will not want to invest in the City of London because it is a very expensive process and a very long time period of process for businesses to be authorized
to conduct financial business. And since <coughs> London will no longer have access to the EU's market as a right, businesses will be more incentivized to invest in other EU cities such as Paris or Frankfurt or Berlin, where they will have access to the entire EU's market. Finally, there's the World Trade Organization model. And the World Trade Organization model is the most economically disintegrated model of the three. And the World Trade Organization model is completely outside of the single market. So British businesses will have to pay all EU tariffs when they decide to trade with the EU. And while they can change the, the UK can change its regulation standards, this is highly unlikely that they'll actually do that because the EU will require Britain when it exports to the EU to actually maintain EU regulation. So really this creates a problem of a double standard of regulation. And these economically, these economic alternatives, the more you're disintegrated, the greater the impact is. And the numbers show that. So let's actually look at the numbers now. So remember our three criteria at the beginning. We have GDP, foreign direct investment, and wages. And we have our three models. And for the, let's start off with the Norwegian model, which is the most economically integrated of the three with the European Union. When the, e, when the Britain leaves the EU, it would roughly lose around 4.36% of its GDP, which doesn't sound like a big number, but that's around $114 billion. <laughs> Second, in foreign direct investment, whenever Britain leaves the EU, it will lose around 10% of its foreign direct investment, so its economy will be actually not as much based on foreign, uh, foreign investment, which means that other countries won't actually be as successful whenever the UK is successful. And finally, wages will decrease around 6.1% a year, which is a reduction in $3,800 a year to the average British paycheck. Now, in the free trade agreement model, they will lose around 6.2% of their gross domestic product, which is around 162 billion dollars worth of GDP. Foreign direct investment will decrease around 15 to 20 percent. And average wages, well, there's not a clear consensus among economists for what this number would be. If I was going to give my guess showing the trend of disintegration with the EU, I would project that it would be around 9 percent to 10 percent of GDP loss, which would be around six thousand dollars a year. But I'm not comfortable putting that number up on the screen because it's not, a, it's not a consensus by economists. Finally, in the World Trade Organization model, the UK will lose around 7% of its GDP, which is a loss in around $183 billion. Foreign direct investment will decrease around 18 to 26%, and average wages will decrease around 13.5%, which is a loss in around $8,300 a year in the average British paycheck. I think it's important to note, while this chart is up here, that the more economically, and again I said this before, the more economically disintegrated the UK is from the EU, the more and more, uh, the more and more severe the consequences for the UK's economy that there are. Now proponents of Brexit have said that these numbers are wrong, that actual economic modeling shows that there actually might be some type of slight boost. And this is mainly a small group of economists called the Economists for Free Trade, who were formerly known as the Economists for Brexit. Now, the ultimate problem with the Economists for Free Trade is they actually use out-of-date data and they use an out-of-date methodology. The numbers which I just showed you are averages from the London School of Economics, the UK government itself, the OECD, the, Com the Commission for British Industry, the National Institute Economic Review. Whereas you have this one small group of economists using data from 2002 in around 2016 to actually say that, no, 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 our data says that Brexit will be a boost. Data from 2002 does not actually current reflect the current status of our economies. Think of the major economic events which have happened, such as the 2008 financial crisis. We've had wars in Iraq, the war on terror. We've had the 2014 Eurozone crisis. Their data is out of date. It doesn't reflect the current status of our economies today. And second, they do not use gravity modeling. And gravity modeling is the standard for how economics today uh, is projected. And gravity modeling, it's, it's complicated. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But gravity modeling factors in different distances in countries. 
So it's actually cheaper to ship somewhere closer to you than farther away. And it also factors in different outputs because of different sizes in different sectors within different economies. And their model doesn't actually show this. Now, other opponents of Brexit, or other proponents of Brexit, excuse me, have argued that, well, there still might be something to gain from Brexit, even though the economy is going to take a steep decline. We might gain control in immigration. We might gain control in regulation. We gain control from the European Court of Justice. There's this common saying, we gain control from Brussels. London is in charge, no longer Brussels. And the ultimate problem is that they're honestly advocating for national sovereignty. They make it sound like it's a lot of different areas where there's a lot of gain, but they all compound really into national sovereignty is what Britain gains as a result of Brexit. And the problem with justifying Brexit purely on national sovereignty is it's with the assumption that national sovereignty will actually benefit the British citizens. So for instance, immigration. This is one of those that the UK government is very explicit on reducing. They want to reduce immigration by around to less than 100,000 immigrants per year. But this actually makes no sense. Immigrants who come from the EU on average are more educated. They're not, in, we think a lot as Americans in national security. When you look at the terrorist attacks that have happened recently in the UK, they're by British citizens, not other EU citizens. They don't pose a danger threat. And these EU citizens, so they're raising the standards of education. They're actually working harder. And there's this lump of labor fallacy. Many people think, well, they're just taking all our jobs and they're taking our housing. This is a fallacy. When people come into a country, it actually creates more jobs because you have to have more people to support the increase in people. And you need more houses, which also creates more jobs because you need more people to build those houses. This idea that national sovereignty is worth justifying Brexit is simply false because propo uh, proponents of Brexit have failed to demonstrate that there will actually be some type of benefit to the British citizens, that control will actually benefit them <coughs> by leaving. And quite frankly, all they say is, well, we gain control, but they never, they fail to explain how Britain will benefit from this control. And it's not a valid justification for such a disastrous economic impact. So let's recap what we have seen. The evidence has shown us with these numbers, <coughs> there they are. The evidence has showed us that the more the UK disintegrates itself from the European Union, the more disastrous the economic consequences. We've seen that, and we've, we've looked at three models, which most economists agree are the most likely options. The Norwegian model, the Canadian model, the World Trade Organization. And we've seen through our measurements of a healthy economy that in every scenario, Brexit stings a, not just a, it's not just a little sting, but it lands a significant blow to the UK's economy. And with not much actually being able to be gained from Brexit, because while there is sovereignty, with that sovereignty not being able to produce any increase in prosperity, ultimately, the United Kingdom should reverse its decision to leave the European Union because of this disastrous effect to the UK's economy. Thank you.